you know, if your goal is to kill giants and you don't have a giant to hunt, and so you lower the, the bar and you shoot one that's not quite there, well, you've just shot next year's giant. Mm-hmm. And you got to be disciplined to let those bucks uh, get some age on them. And, you know, we was talking before we started recording here about a buck that uh, I'm watching that's five and a half years old. And you asked if I was going to shoot it. And uh-huh. I said, no, I'm going to let him go till he's six and a half. If you want to shoot the true giants, you got to let them mature. You, you, you just got to be disciplined in everything you do. Lights, camera. Follow the trail. I'm ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching them. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> The Exodus Podcast, your source for all things whitetail. All right, Don. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for having us out here. I know you're busy, and uh, we made the journey out to your farm. We're going to be doing a whitetail cribs, yep. uh, which we've been looking forward to for a really long time. And looks like you just finished up gorgeous house property. It looks amazing. Well, it's almost done. Uh, the house is, is done, but uh, a little bit of yard work left, and I'm hoping to have it done before October 1st, so I can head to the woods and not have to worry about jobs I need to do at home. So. That yeah, how how long has this project been? It's been two years, and uh, you know, whenever we started uh, last year, I had every I thought I had everything in order to as soon as uh, the weather broke in the spring that we could be working on this house and starting the construction, and I'd be done by the first of September. Well, here it is a year later in September and we're still just now wrapping it up. So uh-huh. anybody that's thinking about building a new house, I'm telling you, it's not going to be a six month ordeal. It's a two year ordeal. Would you do it all over again if you had to? Oh yeah. 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 We, uh, we love it up here, but, uh, you know, never having built a house before we wasn't sure what to expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it turned out awesome. We're in your, your office here with all the different deer and, uh, you got smoky email and, and many of the other, which ones where's Trump at? Trump would be, the top, far one uh, the top there. right yep yep so um a lot of different big deer here and i it's been fun because we've done a handful of these podcasts and now that you do the chasing giants on every monday morning i've, I've really had to dig deep here to try to figure out some questions that hopefully are uh, uh of use for everyone but what's it been like answering all the q a every week because i listen i don't catch every episode but there's a lot of really good questions that listeners are sending in well you know the crazy thing is is we get way more questions than we can use so you know, every week we answer anywhere from three to five listener submitted questions, and we're picking from about 50 or so. If we pick somebody's question, you know, they really beat the odds because uh, most of them don't get answered. So. <laughs> I, I would love to look at some of those questions that come in. <laughs> I'm sure there's some interesting things. But one thing, it's September right now, and I think people are really excited for this upcoming season. And with comes excitement, sometimes comes misjudgments mm-hmm. um, in a variety of ways. And I think um, something that you've preached a lot is uh, being disciplined and being calculated for the season. So I want to kind of dive into that, but point blank, do you think disciplined hunters kill more big deer than people that are not as disciplined? Well, there's no doubt about it. Uh Um, I say that uh, if you're, you're serious, you've got a goal. Um, Most deer hunters don't have a goal. They have a dream. They dream of shooting big deer, but they don't really approach it as a goal and do whatever it takes to reach that goal. Instead, they're just dreaming about it maybe happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, discipline is what it takes to, to make it happen. If you want to shoot a 170, for example, um, you can't be shooting 160s. And 160s is a great buck. Um, it's tough to let them walk. But if you want to kill 170s, the 160s got to walk. Mm-hmm. When Because this is something I struggle with a lot is because I feel your experience, 40 plus years of hunting, you can be a lot more disciplined and calculated because you have more Mm -hmm. experience to draw on of, okay, well, this is the right decision where something that I think myself and probably a lot of younger hunters struggle with is trying to be not passive, but also aggressive, but also disciplined and making a good decision. So what would you say to someone that is just trying to figure out what, how do you balance Everything. Well, it, it takes time. I mean, nobody starts out just shooting giants. My success in the last five years or so has really skyrocketed. But, you know, right prior to that, I, I had nearly 40 years experience, um, but I was still not to the point I wanted to be. So mm-hmm. you got to enjoy each step along the way. I mean, when I started, I was happy to shoot any deer. And then it became bucks only. And then it became at least eight pointers. And then they had to be at least 125 inches, Pope and Young. And each one of them steps didn't happen, you know, each season. I I might be at a certain stage for several seasons shooting Mm -hmm. eight pointers, for example. And then when I got 
proficient at that, then I moved the, raised the bar and, and went to the next level. And I, maybe I was there for several years and then I raised the bar. So, you know, you look around here and um, Wes Delk's a young business partner of mine, 30 years old, he tells me I make it look easy. And what he doesn't see is the 40, the 40 years. years before he came along and all the seasons where I didn't tag a deer. The experience is the biggest thing because, uh, you know, I'll see a situation and it'll remind me of a previous situation. Well, if you're not old enough to have that previous experience, you don't have anything to relate back to. I just have been doing it long enough now that I've got plenty of past experience that I can relate back to when I see a situation, you know, it all comes together. So there's really, there's, it's just hard knocks. You got to, you have to do the reps, have the seasons and, and in anything, if you're trying to grow, there's usually discomfort or mm-hmm. that, that sore period. So what you're describing is those years when you're not killing a buck, those are, those are the sore years. Right. And you know, it still happens. I didn't shoot a buck. I didn't shoot a deer period last year, mm-hmm. but, uh, I, I could have don't, um, I don't think anybody doubts that, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if your goal is to kill giants and, and you don't have a giant to hunt, and so you lower the, the bar and you shoot one that's not quite there, well, you've just shot next year's giant mm-hmm. and you got to be disciplined to let those bucks, uh, get some age on them. And, you know, we was talking before we started recording here about a buck that, uh, I'm watching that's five and a half years old. And you asked if I was going to shoot it. And uh-huh. I said, no, I'm going to let him go till he's six and a half. If you want to shoot the true giants, you got to let them mature. Mm-hmm. and uh, you, you just got to be disciplined in everything you do. So let's say someone that's that's tagging a, a solid deer every year, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, that you know are consuming whitetail content year-round and, and doing a lot of the work. What is something that that person needs to hear to help try to get to the next level of going from killing nice deer to, you know, the next level up, I guess? What what is com- What is the most common attribute that they're missing, or what what have you seen? Well, I think that uh, what keeps a, a lot of hunters from killing true giants is that they are too good. They are too good at killing those bucks that aren't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. And they've they've got to change their tactics and their approach a little bit to take the next step as a deer hunter. Mm-hmm. And they become so good at, at killing those, say, three, four-year-old bucks that they just, it's hard for them to change their tactics to kill six-year-old bucks. Mm-hmm. And and you absolutely have to, because it's a totally different animal. What are some of those tactics that people need to change from killing a three to a four-year-old to the next age class up? The older bucks are going to tolerate so much less human intrusion. I mean, the, their tolerance level is just, it, it doesn't even compare. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you can't get away with making mistakes. So that that's the, the first thing. You, you got to be disciplined enough to sit back and pick your your hunts um you don't just find a buck and rush in and start hanging stands everywhere and you know a lot of times i'll hunt a buck and i maybe only have one or two stands for that buck and each of those stands requires very specific wind directions very specific times of the season and things like that and if you go in before you're just ruining your chances you've you've just blown it before you even had your opportunity and uh with you know three and four year old bucks you can get away with a lot of things that the mature buck he's just He's so sharp and he's so in tune with his surroundings that you're not going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. So in short, basically, does that person have to screw up a handful of times? Because I just, I I can't be calculated. Like, this is part of me just asking because I try to figure that out. And like, well, he's in there now, I think. And this this is one of the questions that I had specifically is, you know, on some of the content you you make mention of waiting until a, a buck daylights before you go in there. Do you ever try to anticipate like, well, he might be going into daylight. So you try to predict that. Oh, absolutely. I, one of the, the key ways that I kill these giants is, um, uh, with past history with that deer trail camera history. And I think a lot of guys misuse their trail cameras. They're, you know, putting that camera out, even if, if it's a cell cam, you know, they get a picture, oh, he's moving in daylight. It's time to go hunt. No, it was time to go hunting before he was moving in daylight or right before, and, you know, I can point out some bucks on this wall and tell stories you know there's bucks that i've killed the first day i hunted them the first hunt the first morning in fact this joey buck right here beside me Mm -hmm. watched that buck for three years killed him the first 15 minutes i hunted him but i knew what it was going to take and i waited for those conditions to be perfect i had my stands in place two years before i ever climbed in it and shot him 15 minutes after i climbed in it but it doesn't happen like that all the time you just got it. It's the trail camera history from previous seasons is going to tell you what that buck's going to do this coming season. Mm-hmm. So let's say someone out there this year, 
they got access to a new farm and they they found a target deer, that next caliber animal that they that they want to try to shoot. What is your step one for that person? And it's a permission knock on like, you know, yeah, you can hunt it this year. There's really no, yeah, you can hunt it the year after that too. It's just, mm-hmm. you have one year, you find the deer. What is step one for you? Step one is getting those trail cameras out. Mm-hmm. You want to see what's on the property and uh, also how they're moving across that property. But, um, you, you know, I, I think a lot of people get too aggressive and then they get permission for a new property. What do they got to do? First thing they got to do is they got to walk in. They got to scout every square inch of that property. And in the process, they just bust all the deer off. And they put any mature bucks are on high alert. And um, you, I play it very conservative, um, sit back and, um, you know, my stands, my, my initial stands will be more observation type stands. They're, they're stands where I do have a chance of killing a deer. But I really want to observe. I want to be able to watch a lot of real estate and see where the deer are coming out of the woods into the fields, whatever, um, how they're using different wind directions to travel uh, through or across the property. And uh, you, you got to put the pieces together. I mean, it's really tough to go into a new property and kill a giant. Mm-hmm. It, it can be done, but uh, it, it's a whole lot easier if you know what those deer are going to do before they do it. So in a perfect world, if, if let's say you got that access to that new farm this year, to be more careful, survey it, and hope to have a more precise plan the following year is best case scenario? You know, I just, uh, I was texting with a guy last night about a, a, a big buck we both know about, and I, I'm going to be hunting this fall, but it's going to be my first time in that area hunting. And I told him that my odds of killing that deer this fall are is pretty darn slim. But if that buck survives the second year, I, I know what he's going to be doing next year. And n- next year, my odds of killing that deer are quadruple what they are the first year. So we'll, we'll put you on the spot. What are your odds of killing that deer this year? The the giant I told you about? <laughs> yeah. Um, no more than 25%. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. So, and then uh, quadruple of 25% is 100%. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> so, I, I would say if that buck, if I don't kill that buck in two seasons, I'll be shocked. Okay. But, you know, somebody else could sure. kill him. He'd get hit by a car or anything, anything else. Yeah. But if I've got two seasons to put it together, uh-huh. I mean, I'll, I'll flood that area with trail cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're out there 24 hours a day seven days a week and uh, by the time the second season rolls around i know what he's going to do before he's going to do it and then i've got the opportunity to go in in the spring and and get all my stands ready so i'm not stomping in there right before season Mm -hmm. and trying to do it then Uh, i'm prepared and then i'm just sitting back once things green up in the spring i'm not going back except to put some cameras out in the summer Mm -hmm. but i'm not going in where my stands are and uh in a situation like that are you are you moving your cameras from where they're at in the summer to are you going in and shifting your cameras, you know, in September or what does that look like? Yeah, I would say, well, I put my cameras out about um, 4th of July weekend is when I typically put mm-hmm. a lot of them out. About the 1st of July, first week of July, uh, I'm putting them on summer feeding areas. I've got, I, I know where there's bachelor groups that stay every single year and they come back to the same place every year. And that's where I'm putting those cameras on those summer feeding patterns where these bachelor groups are. And then around Labor Day weekend and 1st of September, I'm shifting those to the fall range. And, and I want that camera there on that fall range before the buck gets there. I, I want to know when he shows up. Mm. And, uh, you know, if he don't show up where I'm hunting him until well, this buck right here, right there is a perfect example. He didn't show up on the property I had permission to hunt him until November 6th. And you could you could mark it on the counter. He was not going to be there before November 6th. Well, he's one of those bucks. Uh, the year I decided to shoot him, he was six years old. Um, the year I decided that, that he was going to be on my hit list, I didn't go and hunt that property at all. Mm. And then the November 6th rolls around. Guess what? The wind is wrong. There's where discipline comes in. I, I, I stayed away. November 7th comes around. The wind's still wrong. I stay out. November 8th, the wind was right. And I went in and I shot him the first morning I ever hunted for him. So was, was he there the 6th and 7th? Or was the wind on the 8th was the same as the 6th the year before? Um, You know, to be honest, I don't remember if he was there on the 6th. But uh, <laughs> the Within about 48 hours of the 6th sure. is when he showed up. I mean, he never showed up earlier than the 6th. Yeah. That was the earliest he ever showed up. And the crazy thing was, he didn't 
he was just there during the rut looking for the does that were on that property. So the last picture I would get of that deer was of about November 20th. So there was a two week period in mid November when that deer was on that property, mm-hmm. you know, fairly frequently. And I knew that two week window was my chance to kill him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I would have never known that if I would have just got permission on that farm that fall, I would have never known. I might've probably been in there in late October and I'd have burned it up. Yeah. yeah I'd have had it burned out before he ever showed up. Yeah. And I can speak from experience. Sometimes when you have a floater camera on that small little farm that you just, and then it's something similar to that, where if, mm-hmm. if you were hunting there, I don't know if that would actually, if, you, if that deer would show up actually or not, or if you push the doe family out from hunting it too much. Right. Um, that's interesting. So what was the, what was the wind, the wind direction when you ended up shooting that deer? What was that stand set up for? Uh, it was set up for an east wind. So let's, let's talk about that. Why do you like east wind so much? East winds um, almost always accompany a weather front. And um, just a, it seems like uh, when you get that weather front, the deer are on their feet. And I've got a lot of stands that are set up for an east wind just because, you know, if I get permission on a property, I'm not going in there and trying to force the issue. If, if, the only, if there's only two good stands on the property, well, there's only two good stands. I'm not trying to put three. Mm-hmm. And if one of those requires an east wind, which is not very common, so be it. I'll wait for that east wind. And some years I may not even get the east wind, but I know when that east wind happens, I can go there and I can see whatever's on that farm that day. Mm-hmm. Um, you, if I had to pick a, a favorite wind, it would be east every time. I agree. I, the deer I shot this year was on an east wind. One of my other favorite like November hunts was on an east wind, mm-hmm. and they're all morning hunts on an east wind yep. uh, during that, you know, between the 5th and the 12th of November, which you talk mm-hmm. about a lot. So east winds, because that's another thing too, is um, when you look at a farm, when I shot that deer on that farm, I was like, man, for an east wind, this will be awesome. I was talking to somebody, like, why would you even plan for an east wind? And uh, it definitely, I see that too. So out of uh, all the deer you've shot, how many percentage wise do you think are east winds? And I, that's a very oddly specific <laughs> question. but <laughs> uh, Probably not all that many, really. It's just a high productive um, day. Yeah, when it when it's I, I see a lot of bucks on east winds, um, but you know when you're targeting one specific buck, um, you don't shoot very often. Uh, I mean, the last year I never drew my bow for the entire season. I never drew my bow, and uh, that's just the kind of discipline it takes. But I would say, I don't know, probably. 10 to 20 percent were on east winds that's fair i th- i think the the message there is th- don't don't count on an east wind and maybe have that east wind set up in the back of your mind mm-hmm. uh, or at least identify those on on parcels and don't uh don't discount that um what about so you've traveled on how many consultations have you done now in the last 12 years do you think oh it's probably Probably not as many as you'd think. Probably four hundred. Yeah, that's 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 quite a few. <laughs> so, out of those four hundred, has there been any anything that you've learned from talking to all your consultants, or has it solidified anything that you've considered uh, as like you know I mm-hmm. think this, and then you talk to four hundred people who are super serious about hunting whitetails? They're like, well, I guess have you connected any dots from that? Well, I think the big takeaway that, that I've seen from all that is that. Typically today, when I go and meet with a client, I know within the first 30 minutes if he's, if he's wasting his money. If he's going to implement what you tell him? Well, it, it's a matter of getting it. Do, does he get it? Does he understand what I'm saying? And um, and a lot of them do, don't get me wrong. But mm-hmm. occasionally I get that guy that I just, I can't get through to him. I'm trying every angle I can think of to describe and, and to, to get his attention and to come up with scenarios and stories from my hunting and, and whatever, to get him to buy into what I'm saying. And mm-hmm. I think a lot, and I blame it on the internet <laughs> because the internet is so full of misinformation mm-hmm. that these guys get on there and, and they listen to a bunch of garbage and, and they buy into it. And then I come and I tell them something that I know works. And what's really frustrating is most of the time, I'd say a good percentage of my clients have properties that I know could be better than mine. And I know what I've done on my property. If they just listen to me and not try to overcomplicate it, that, that's the big thing. They want to overcomplicate it. They think they got to go in there and they got to do all these little 
projects to make their farm better. And, and what they do is they end up putting so much human pressure on their property. They're chasing the deer out that they want to kill. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people, it's hard to get that through their head. And So what, when you say they don't get it, it's just they put too much pressure on the farm, period. Like they, to summarize they, it. They want to make it more complicated than it really is. Mm-hmm. And in the process, they just don't, uh, they just don't accept that it, it's, that can, simple. it's It's pretty simple, really. Uh huh. Yeah. I could see where that could be frustrating. Cause I, I mean, I think oftentimes people that are looking into so much stuff, sometimes they're their worst critic or their worst victim. And they mm-hmm. overthink things or try to, um, to your point, make things harder than what they really are and just keep it simple. This is what works. Yeah. I mean, the the guys that have the most success, my, the clients that I have that have the most success are people that follow the plan the closest. Mm-hmm. If someone ever has a complaint, it doesn't happen very often, but you know, I can think of a couple times over the past year where a client had an issue with the plan I laid out, and, and when I asked him, "Well, have you implemented anything?" No, they haven't. T- they haven't even started on the plan, but they already know that it ain't going to work. They mm-hmm. already know that they've wasted their money. And come on, now you paid somebody. It's proven to work on multiple properties. Give it a chance. Yeah. And if they give it a chance, I don't hear a complaint one. Mm -hmm. How long does it typically take someone to go from plan in their hand that you develop to seeing noticeable increases or, you know, uh, positive returns? That varies by property. I, I, most clients, I tell them to think of it as a five year process. Um, here's your plan today start implementing it as quick as you can for you to see a huge noticeable difference. You're probably looking at five years. However, I've seen properties that a lot of things were already being done right. And and with just a few tweaks to the approach that they're taking, I I tell them, you know, this property can, you know, be day and night difference in one season. Mm -hmm. So, um, but most of the time I tell them that think of it as a five-year process. Mm -hmm. That's which in the grand scheme of things goes a lot faster than, than, probably what they realize because it takes time to to do those improvements. Right. Yeah. So uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about this next age class of deer acting different than three and four year olds. And obviously this is different across the country, but just speaking in the Midwest, let's say, where do you find or see where a lot of these next caliber deer are calling their sanctuary or where they're spending the majority of their daylight hours? Well, they're getting away from humans. It it all boils down to that. They're getting away from any human activity mm-hmm. and it could be a it could be a one tree out in the middle of a wide open ag prairie one tree with a few weeds around it that buck would rather bed there than he would in a hundred acres of the best most pristine whitetail habitat on the planet if that that good habitat has human intrusion mm-hmm. um freedom of human intrusion is so important it's absolutely number one when you want to kill giants you got to get away from everybody if you're sharing a property with one other person, you've got no control over what they're doing. And most of the time they're stomping through scouting, doing this, doing that. Mm-hmm. I would rather have one acre to myself than a thousand acres that I'm sharing with other people. So what about when you're trying to hunt public? <laughs> That's a challenge and uh-huh. I'm, I'm up for it. I'm trying going to try it <laughs> this year. Actually, if, um, I've planned to spend quite a bit of time on some public this year, but, uh, it's the same thing, though. Get There's going to be pockets where people overlook. Sometimes it's really close to a road. Sometimes it's way off the road. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's going to be places that uh, people overlook, and that's exactly where the, the bigger bucks are going to be. Mm-hmm. So basically the same exact thing, just trying to get away from people is your plan right. on that. Because mm-hmm. hmm. you, uh, I think the last time, that was one of your goals was to kill a Boone and Crockett animal off, or Boone and Crockett whitetail off public land. Right. So you've been pretty successful at achieving your other goals. <laughs> well, finding a, a booner on public is a challenge. I mean, I've been looking for a lot of years, so, um, and then killing them is not easy either, but, mm-hmm. but finding them is, you know, it takes years to find one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that <laughs> certainly. So in, you made mention before too of, of using, and we're, asked about the beaver here you said you did a lot of trapping when you were younger uh-huh. of using cameras similar to how you would use a trap line or do a trap line mm-hmm. what what does that mean or can you explain what that strategy looks like well in in trapping there's a a system called gang sets if you will where 
a trapper will go into a small area and he'll throw a bunch of, of sets there. So, you know, if a pack of coyotes comes through, he, he's got a several traps where he can catch a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I think most of us have probably seen those pictures where a guy has three coyotes and three different traps close together. Well, those are gang sets. And, and I employ the same thing with the uh, trail cameras. Um, you know, if, for instance, let's say you've got a tree line that the deer follow that tree line. Well, you put one camera on it facing one direction, every deer on the other side of the tree line you miss. Mm -hmm. So I'll put one on facing each direction. Um, if it's a little bit wider, narrow strip, narrow strip of cover, but a little bit wider than tree line, I'll have one in the middle as well. So if it doesn't matter if they follow this edge, this edge, or right down the middle, I've got it covered with a camera. Mm Mm-hmm. When it comes to hunting giants, you cannot afford to miss an opportunity at a picture or to get his picture. Sure. And uh, you can't have him going behind the camera and not getting his picture. Put another camera there and face it that the other direction. Especially when you're trying to figure out when he shows up, when he's leaving, and you have that narrow window of, right. of killing him. So mm-hmm. what, are you doing those types of sets once you know there's a big deer in the area and then you you start shotgunning more cameras in there? Or is it just... um Some of both. Uh-huh. If I'm trying to learn a new property, I'll do it. Uh, if I know there's a giant there, then I'm really saturating the area with cameras. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, then I've got places where I might only have one camera too. So, so how are you using cell cameras on those? Or are you going and checking those? I mean, I guess we could just run through a scenario. You, you, this year you get a picture. You got access to a brand new farm. Uh, it's September. You got a picture of a big deer that you want to know more about. You go out. <clears throat> you string out a line of cameras. Are you going in to check those throughout the season or are you using cell cameras or are you just letting that soak this year to mm-hmm. be really uh, refined for next year? Well, I'm doing some of both. Um, you know, the cameras that I, are not non-cell cameras, I'm checking those uh, roughly once a month. Um, I, I've let them go as long as five or six months without checking them, you know, but mm-hmm. it just, it, every situation is a little bit different and every property is a little bit different. If I if it's a situation where I can get in there real easy and check the camera without disturbing the the property, then yeah, I'm going to check it probably about once a month. But if if that camera is you know right in the heart of the deer bedding cover where it's a lot tougher to check it without spooking deer, then I may only check it once every three months. Mm-hmm. So, so do you try to check your cameras in coordination with rainstorms or anything else like that, or is it just kind of when you get to it and you have a minute? Um. Well, I've got so many anymore that it's kind of hard. To check I mean, all of them, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, – no, there's there's really no rhyme or reason. Uh, I, t- I do check them in midday. I don't like being out early in, in the morning or late in the evening. Um, check them windy. I really like windy days. That wind can cover a whole lot of noise and, and uh, movement and disturbance, and you can get in and out without bumping the deer near as bad on a windy day. So mm-hmm. midday when it's really windy is probably my favorite. Okay. That's yeah. Getting, uh, getting the free time to go do it in coordination of that's a different story, but yeah, uh, best, best practice for sure. What's something that you've completely changed your mind on f- over the last 40 years of hunting? Oh, completely changed my mind on, um, well, I think probably all the gimmicks that are marketed to deer hunters when there was a day when I bought everything that came along. I mean, it didn't matter what it was decoys, um, every scent known to man, uh, every call known to man, um, every camouflage, every this, every scent elimination spray or any scent elimination product, period. And, you know, I, I sound hunting practices are worth way more than all these gadgets and gizmos mm-hmm. combined. And uh, a guy can go out there in blue jeans and a flannel shirt and a, a stick and string recurve bow. And if he's got sound hunting practices, he's going to be more successful than the guy that's got every gadget known to man, but doesn't really have the woodsmanship skills. Mm-hmm. I think people feel the more money they spend to buy stuff, the better they feel they are at deer hunting. Right. And I think that's a product of the, a lot of the well, industry. Yeah. The industry is really capitalized on uh, deer hunters willingness to spend money mm-hmm. to, to help him kill a deer if he thinks it's going to help him kill a deer he's he'll shuck out all kinds of money <laughs> right so what is, what is a piece of misinformation that floats around on the internet that you cringe the most at oh i cringe the uh, most you can, i cringe you can all give the time a couple, you can give a couple though oh uh, 
of just like, I wish people just stopped listening to this specific advice. Well, a lot of it is, is land management advice. Um, you know, I call it the big buck merry-go-round where these guys promote ideas where you got to have, you know, <laughs> buck bed here and you got to have a water hole here and you got to do this. And all those things work to some degree, but you you put so much pressure on a property when you do all these things that you're it's really counterproductive. And I think the best way to describe it is, is, is you start your property is at a certain level. And you want to improve that. So you start doing these projects and, and it gets better and better. But th there's a there's a point where everything you've done, it just crashes. And, and you're, you're, you go down lower than what, what it was when you started. The of, of what you're well, doing. Well, you've not only are you not doing any good anymore, but you end up with a property that's worse than where you started. So that's that's what you cringe at the most then? Probably some of that <laughs> land management garbage uh -huh. that's out there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. That's fair. Um, I'm trying to think here. We have a couple questions from uh, a couple questions from uh, YouTube that we posted here. So I'm going to pull this up. We'll, we'll snap. Yeah, this, so we'll cut this, this ought out. to be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got some interesting questions. I'm going to pull it up. So some of these are, I would consider more rapid fire and some of them probably deserve or have a, a, a deeper explanation, but okay. Justin Hoover asked, what is better morning or evening hunts in your opinion? Well, that's easy. If it's uh, early season, late season evenings, without a doubt during the rut mornings. Mm -hmm. And so what do you consider when are you, cause I know typically you don't hunt mornings in October until the very end. Right. What, what is kind of that date that you have circled on your calendar to where you're watching for a cold front or something that would trigger a morning hunt for you? Well, I'll hunt mornings any cold front after about October 25th. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't get a cold front at the end of October, I don't hunt a morning in October. And I, I didn't hunt mornings in October for many years. Um, but in, in recent years, that's one thing I've changed my mind about in recent years is um, I, I was way too conservative, I think. And, and I've always erred on the side of caution. Um, just because I've spooked way too many mature bucks over the years and, and figured out that I'd rather be too cautious than too aggressive. But in, in recent years, those late October cold fronts are fantastic times to kill deer and even on a morning hunt. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I really don't have a date. It, it's usually based on the weather more than anything. But say roughly the first cold front, October 25th and after, uh, I'll be hunting mornings. Mm -hmm. What are some of those morning? What does that morning setup look like for that late October? Because one of your, what is the first setup? Like first morning hunt of the year, what does your setup look like? Well, I'm in bedding cover mm -hmm. and usually right on the edge of bedding cover where I've got the wind to my advantage. Mm -hmm. um, the bucks are going to be playing the wind, no doubt about it. You got to know what he's going to be doing and how he's going to be coming through that bedding area as he looks for does or he's going back to bed just a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's always a bedding cover. And when you say playing the wind, I think it's probably different than what most people are initially thinking of. Okay, well, I need to be, what does the playing the wind mean to you? Well, you're, you're giving the buck the wind that he needs to feel comfortable and be on his feet. I think a lot of people, a lot of deer hunters, they, uh, they're expecting that buck to commit suicide. They're expecting a, um, or they're, they're hunting a wind where that buck is, does not have the wind to his advantage right. whatsoever. And you, you got to allow him to do what he thinks is keeping him safe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but at the same time, then you're set up just off to the side where a lot of times he's coming in with a quartering nose wind. So it's not straight in his nose, but it's quartering into his nose. So if you're on this side of the trail, he's still coming with that nose wind, but you're off to the right side of the trail where he can't smell you. Mm -hmm. And then where your scent ends up it needs to be in an area where there's very low likelihood that there's going to be any deer catch you. Mm -hmm. uh, like a dead zone. So what would be some of those, what would be some of those dead zones, um, for example, so people can maybe figure that out? Well, like in ag country, <laughs> ag country, a lot of times it's an open ag field. Mm -hmm. um, you get in a heavily timbered area, and it's a ravine. You know, I like to come up a, a ravine. Um and have my scent blowing right back down that ravine. And, and as those deer cut across, they're usually doing it with a crosswind, uh, but it's something that they'll definitely do. Mm -hmm. um, 
you, you just got to put it put it in an area where there's very likely or low likelihood of, of deer being there and they're not going to be down in the in a gully mm-hmm. and that's where the kind of areas you want your scent to be blowing do you ever have clients try to create those dead zones like pile up a bunch of brush or, or oh yeah some, yeah yep that's a, a, a viable tactic mm-hmm. okay um let's see all right this, um and there's some of these well here's here's a question i have how many it's September 14th. How many deer do you think are on your farm right now? Oh, Does and maybe 15. Total? Yeah. And then, but we were talking too, like later in the year, it fluctuates quite a bit. Oh, yeah. So is that 15 deer on the farm a pretty steady average throughout the summer and then spikes once food becomes, food and cover becomes more scarce? Yeah, during the summer, you know, we're, we'll have about a dozen, 15 deer, I'd guess, on, on the farm. And most of those are does. Um, but as the fall goes on, as crops get harvested, as hunting pressure picks up around the farm, those deer just migrate in more and more. I, I literally have more deer on this farm the last day of season than any other time, even more than during the rut. And the reason for it is I've got the security cover where they feel safe, but right next to that security cover, I've got the food Mm -hmm. and that's what holds them here. And they just want to spend all their daylight hours here. So, uh, it's just the deer population on this property just builds throughout the season. Mm -hmm. And how many, how much food do you leave standing out here roughly? Oh, probably 10 to 12 acres. Okay. And that. How much of that is roughly grain, and how much is that roughly? It's probably two thirds grain and one third greens. Okay, okay, gotcha. When do you think is the best time to shoot does if you do need to shoot does? Well, th- to be honest, the best time is early because you're shooting resident does. Like the number of does on this farm will quadruple throughout the season, but they're coming from other places. Mm-hmm. Um, early in the season, the deer that are here are the resident deer. And if you want to control the population on your farm, um, you need to shoot them early because if you wait till the end of season, the, there's a very high likelihood that the deer you shoot are not going to be deer that they're going to be deer that would have left anyway in the mm-hmm. spring. So that's the best time. But uh, from a hunting <laughs> aspect, that, that puts a lot of pressure on your property too, right ahead of the rut and mm-hmm. ahead of the best time to kill buck. Do you think, so let's say you, you kill some does early in the season and then they're gone, they're dead. And then if your farm is pulling deer from elsewhere later in the season, do they just fill those spots though? Or do they typically leave? Well, I, they're going to come no matter what, if I shoot leave. them or don't. Uh-huh. Um, but more than True. likely they're going to go back to, to wherever their home is at, mm-hmm. um, you know, after the winter's over. Um, so the, the big thing about controlling the does is, is it needs to be you can't hardly do it on one property it needs to be a whole neighborhood event yeah. everybody needs to take part in it otherwise you're just you're putting pressure on your property um while your neighbors are not and you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot for for shooting big bucks mm-hmm. um the luckily I, I live in an area we don't have a very high deer population but uh so i don't have to deal with that a whole lot but I, a lot of clients have that issue and uh you know they'll say you know i could shoot 30 does and <laughs> next year i've got just as many as i had before well all you've done by shooting 30 does is put pressure on your farm uh, that the neighbors are not everybody in the area needs to be shooting 30 does um but if we don't you know at some point mother nature is going to take care of the problem through ehd or you know, some disease so mm-hmm. Hey, it's kind of, you can either do it or mother nature is going to do it. Okay. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, what was the single, this is from, uh, Ryan Stanko. Uh, what was the single best property you have ever consulted on or ever stepped foot on? And what about that property made it so good? Hmm. Was it access, habitat, topography, neighborhood, buck genetics? Well, I've, I've been on a lot of really good properties. Uh, first of all, a good property has got to have access. Um, it's got to have good access. The, the better properties will have, uh, access from multiple directions and the really good ones will have access from four directions. Uh, that's one thing that's really 
been great about this farm is that my neighbors are uh, allow me to cut across their open ag fields um, to, to always get the win. So access is huge. Uh, the genetics um, is important too if you want to grow giants. I'd have a hard time pinning down one specific property that I would say is the absolute number one best. Um, but I've got a handful that, that quickly come to mind is really good. One was in northern Indiana. Um, what made it so good was it was right next to a big no hunting sanctuary. Um, it just laid out in such a way that you could put food on that property and you could pull all those deer out of that sanctuary through like a transition zone on the property. And you could, you could have all kinds of hunting opportunities with various wind directions, um, on, on that property and easy access. It could be accessed from three directions. The only access the, the only direction you could not access um, was the direction of that sanctuary, that no hunting sanctuary. But other than that, you could come in from three directions. Um, it, it'd be really simple to kill the biggest buck there <laughs> on that, that farm year after year. I mean, I'm not saying you could go out and do it in two days, but if you put the time in, you could kill the biggest buck in that area mm -hmm. year after year. That That's interesting. Would that ever get boring for you? Uh, I wouldn't say it gets it would get boring, but I can tell you that shooting a big deer on my farm today is not near as exciting as it is to shoot one somewhere else. Because if a buck shows up on this farm and I want to kill him, it's it's a done deal. And I'm not bragging; it's just it, we're only talking 120 acres. I've had it set up. Um, I, I've man manipulated things to get those deer in front of my stands. And if one shows up, he's and I want to kill him, he's dead. There's uh there's another level of satisfaction when I go somewhere like the Joey Buck here beside me. He's not my biggest. Um, but there was a great deal of satisfaction in going into that area and on the first time I ever hunted, it took I, I waited three years. I studied everything for three years and then boom, I went in and made it happen in fifteen minutes. And there's a there's satisfaction there that I just don't find on my place because uh well, like I said, if one shows up here, he's dead. If I want to shoot him, it's a it's a a, a formula that you kind of have figured out at at this point. Mm -hmm. When's does it has a deer on here ever thrown you for it's a giant curveball and a swing and a miss? Um, not in the last uh, fifteen years. <laughs> when I started, yeah, there was sure. there was a box uh, that big eight Felt big frame eight point up there. Yep. Um, I, I didn't get him killed until the last week of season, and he just. There was a doe fawn that, that came in heat, and they were uh, headed out to feed in a, in a food plot in the afternoon, and and she pulled him out. And he, he's just one that didn't move a lot in daylight. Um, but that that doe fawn coming in heat brought him out. So he, he was a pretty tough customer. But um, <laughs> tough today, customer. <laughs> that was – you got to remember that was 15 years ago, too, before I had this place all tricked out. Today, I'd kill that deer within a week if I wanted to. That's crazy. So how was he spending a ton of time on here too? Oh yeah, I was getting his this. picture all the time. <laughs> yeah, he was here, uh -huh. but he just wasn't moving much in daylight. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, another question here, Austin Phillips, what kind of terrain features are you looking for in farm country uh, when you're either placing trail cameras or brand new stands? Terrain features, any, any place basically that funnels down those deer. Um, you know, tree lines, fence rows, if you will, those deer travel up and down a lot. Um, anytime there's a, a change in cover, you know, it might be a mature woods that meets a, a switchgrass field. They're, they're, whitetails are a creature of edge, and, and they're going to travel those edges. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Transitioning edges where they pinch down. Yep. Okay. Um, here is a question. It uh, has a couple thumbs up, so it must be a good one. Okay. Uh, Tyler Hathaway, in-depth on access routes to and from stands. What does morning versus afternoon access routes look like, or is there a difference? And can you create access routes to a stand that has poor – I want to make sure I read this correctly. Can you create access routes to a stand that has poor access and turn it into a stand with great access? If you can create good access, then how? So I guess we'll start back. Um, what is your what is your access routes look like for morning – in the afternoon stands and are they different well here in farm country i'm almost always coming across an open field with the wind in my face and that doesn't matter if it's morning or evening um so i mean that's that, that's farm country anyway you get into more heavily 
wooded areas like i said earlier i like to use creeks come up ravines ravines and empty into creeks follow that creek till you get to the ravine and go up um mm -hmm. right up to your stand and, and again it doesn't matter if it's morning or afternoon uh, i'm trying to access using areas where there's low likelihood of deer activity and i, I know there's in open ag fields there's deer activity but you know around here these fields are so big and there's so many of them that you just got to play the odds and, and the odds are that a deer is not going to cut your track cutting across uh, to access a stand mm -hmm. is there challenges trying to access stands in the morning while they're potentially out in the ag fields or are you just trying to um potentially but uh again here the fields are so big <laughs> I don't use a flashlight. I just walk across that open field in the dark and I've spooked a few deer, but to be honest, it's darn few. Mm -hmm. I'd say less than 5% of the time while I spook a deer on a morning hunt walking in. Well, yeah. And the other thing too, is you're, um, you're not hunting a bunch of October mornings too. Right. And there's a lot more staining crops and fields mm -hmm. haven't got chisel plowed too. So I think that's an important point. Um, okay. And then what about a stand that has bad access what are some things that you could maybe do to make it good or can you? Well, I've done this on a lot of the properties I consult on is we'll make an access trail. And usually it's a perimeter trail on the property um, to allow you to get around to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. So, And then have your stands, I assume, kind of off the edges of the access trail. Right. For the for the wind. To... Yep. Okay. All right. Um, let me see here. Got a couple more that we could ask. Let's see. Okay, this is an interesting question, and hopefully they're not putting words in your mouth. But uh, Ben, all good. Uh, grown up cattle pasture versus switchgrass. Uh, Don has mentioned several times that the best big buck habitat, hands down, is a grown up cattle pasture. Why put switchgrass if you can do old field management? And hopefully that's not putting any words in your mouth. That's that's what he said. Yeah. Um, well, I, he, he's one hundred percent accurate. I would much rather prefer to old grown up cattle pasture than I would. Uh, anything else mm -hmm. be it switchgrass or, or whatever um the, the big thing is that you can create switchgrass cover in a hurry you know in a couple of years you've got some fantastic bedding cover and it takes a little bit longer than that for uh you know a, an old cattle Trees pasture to grow, to grow up yeah you get that woody vegetation is a lot slower growing it's not as thick and it just takes more time um, but given the choice, in fact, I'm looking, I'm trying to buy a property right now. And if I get it bought, there's an area that I would absolutely go in and probably just uh, direct seed with like some acorns. Um, I'll get blackberry seeds, things like that, and just scatter them all over the this particular field. Um, it, it is the best cover there is for whitetails. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, just to dive into that more, what would be some of the, you mentioned acorns, so obviously oaks. Are you planting a, just a variety of? species of oaks and and shrubs and well I, I like the the oak species that hold their leaves in the winter shingle oaks for example pen oaks um swamp white you know holds their leaves really late as well but uh you, you know an oak tree that's that's holding its leaves has every bit as much cover as a conifer as a pine or a Good spruce point. or a cedar so and they do in much of the midwest um, shingle oak, for example, will do fantastic where a, a white pine or a spruce is going to struggle. So, uh, you, you know, a, a patch of, of, uh, shingle oaks is going to make some fantastic cover. Mm -hmm. How long, let's say you bought that farm tomorrow and, and you put up cameras this year and mm -hmm. then you start projects in March. How long do you think it would take that farm to get from whatever it is today to excellent? Oh, I think I could do it in three years. So, because you'd be putting in like the warm season grasses that are going to grow mm -hmm. in that time frame, and then you already have your well. Your the big thing is, is I'm going to kick everybody else off, <laughs> and that's that's number one. So uh, the the deer are going to have zero human intrusion, and that they're going to recognize that pretty quick. Of just yeah, okay. And that's the the crazy thing is all these guys get wrapped up in these different habitat projects that. The most important thing you can do costs you absolutely zero dollars and up. zero minutes of your time. Just stay yeah. the heck out of it. Yeah. And people just can't get that. Well, I think it's because people, they save up forever. Then they finally buy a farm and mm -hmm. then they want to use it and tinker and do projects and make 
themselves feel like they're doing something. And yep. I'm, I'm guilty of this too, but I think that's the hardest thing. But to you, it's just, would you, in a perfect world, I mean, do you, do you have the farm, like the tinker farm for a year where you're like, okay, this year I'm going and I'm making as many mm-hmm. improvements. I'm kind of sacrificing this year to get everything done. This farm has better deer potentially this season. I'm going to leave that one completely alone. You kill that target buck, then you work on that farm the next year. And then mm-hmm. is that a viable strategy? Absolutely. When, when you first buy a farm, I, my suggestion is like with my clients, I tell them all, get it all done as fast as you can. It might not take you, it might take longer than a year, depending on the person's, you know, the time, the free time they have, but get it done and get, then get out. Um, don't be doing a little bit this year, then staying out for six months, then going back and doing a little bit and then staying out, go in and do everything you need to do, then get out. Mm-hmm. It, it takes time to build that, that security factor in the minds of the local deer. And it just builds over time. Um, you know, create the habitat you need, do whatever you need to do, and then get out and stay out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Let me see what other questions we have in here. We had a lot of really good ones. I'm sure we're missing some. Um, okay, this is a fun one, and maybe this is another <laughs> specific question that might be hard. Mark Hall, how many bucks were first-time sits? Um, that'd be tough to say, but a lot of them. Over 50%? Mm. Right about... Well, l- let me ask this to you. How many out of the last 10 years, I bet you, has your first sit efficiency increased over the years? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm <laughs> waiting for the con- conditions to be out. When I was younger, basically, I had, you know, a, a portable stand, you know, similar to a Novick stand and, and sticks. And and I was, I, I used to pride myself on how many different trees I hunted from in a season. I was carrying a stand in. I, I'd... I hunted from 67 different trees this year because I, I knew how important that first time in the stand was. And, uh, but now I play it a little bit different. I got my stands out there and, uh, and I still, you know, put some up, carry them in and put them up, not near as much as I used to, but I, I sit back. Once I get that stand in place, I sit back and wait for the perfect condition to go in and hunt it for the first time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my stands don't get hunted every year. Most of them do not get hunted every year. See, I think that's a hard thing for people to understand too. But I haven't hunted that stand this year. I'm going to go hunt it, throw a hunt at it just for fun Mm -hmm. in reality. Well, targeting giants like I am, you know, a lot of years there's not going to be a giant on on a specific property. So I've got a stand in place. When a giant shows up, I'm set. Mm-hmm. but there may only be one there once every 10 years or so. Now I'll, I'll go in in the off season and I will, you know, make sure that stands safe, you know, loosen the chain, maybe take it down and replace it with another stand or whatever. But is that one of the reasons you use the chain as well? Cause you're leaving your stands for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I won't leave a stand with straps more than, I mean, I'll use it during season, but if I'm going to leave it, I, I'll put a chain on it instead of straps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like a safe thing. Cause I was, I was thinking that too. Like, man, you haven't been in there two years. <laughs> yeah. I've been in some stands. Yeah, they, they've all got chains <laughs> on. Yeah, I think that's an, an important thing to bring up. Um, we got a couple time for a couple here, a couple more extra. Uh, let me see here. This one you kind of answered, but uh, we'll just go through here again. Uh, how do you, how do you identify small blocks or so similar like smaller chunks that are locked down locations during the rut? Uh, mainly from past experience, just seeing bucks with hot does in there. So, it, and those typically will yield a buck locked down on a doe year after year, assuming everything else is the same. Yeah, a lot of times I don't I don't know what it is about them, but there's just certain places where those bucks like to run those hot does, and and it's not just one buck doing it. It's like every year there's a buck out there with a hot doe, and yeah, okay, <laughs> this is a Nathan Clark, what keeps you going every day? Um, it's, it's just my passion. You know, these, these deer, uh, I can't even explain it really. It's just who I am. Uh huh. So it doesn't matter if, what, if it's July or November or what March, I'm thinking about my next big deer and <laughs> I just, uh, what can I be doing today to help me kill my next big one? Mm-hmm. Do you think 
people not taking the off season serious enough is one of the other biggest uh, faults of people not killing, you know, going from killing good deer to giants. Yeah, I wrote an article one time the best ki- the best time to kill a giant, and uh, I I've kind of meant it like best time of season. That's what I wanted people to think when they seen the title. Mm. But what I meant was the best time to kill a giant is in the off season. Um, they say champions are made in the off season in sports. Well, the successful big hunt, big buck killers, they make their success in the off season, what they do to prepare for the season. And, you know, today, believe it or not, um, oh, I had the figures. I, I've killed like of my top five bucks here on this wall. They've all been killed in the last four seasons um, since 2017. Well, four, four of the five have been killed mm-hmm. since 2017. So I hunted 40 years before uh, with only one of my top five in the first 40 years. Four of my top five came in the last four or five years. And yet today I hunt less than I ever have in my life. Time in a tree, mm-hmm. I hunt less today than I ever have, but I spend more time preparing today than I ever have in my life. Yeah, I spend more time in the off season, even during season. I'm spending more time running trail cameras, um, things like that, than I am sitting in a tree with my bow in my hand. Mm-hmm. It's preparation is what makes success, which allows you to take success to the next level. Mm-hmm. Would you say you? <laughs> Because that's the struggle. So if you hadn't had those 40 years, it's like you almost have to have those 40 years of not, maybe not to that amount of years, because I think people can get better faster with the amount of information out there. Mm-hmm. But you have to have those levels of years to become extremely effective on, uh, you know, the later part here. Well, today there's more deer information out there than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, I have alluded to the fact earlier that I think a lot of it's garbage, but there's a lot of good stuff too. The, the challenge today's deer hunter has is separating the garbage from the good information. And, you know, how do you know? How, how does a guy know? He, he's a novice hunter and he gets on the internet. How does he know that this guy's feeding him a line and this guy's giving him solid advice? Mm-hmm. That, that's what's really tough for today's hunter. But, um, you know, back when I started, things like trail cameras were unheard of. I mean, nobody even dreamed of such a thing. Trail cameras have been the biggest game changer I've seen in 45 years of deer hunting. Um, so t- today's hunter, he doesn't need 40 years of experience, but 20 years is going to really help him. You know? <laughs> not the co- not, not, yeah, not the answer people want to hear, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, it's just like the hard knocks of, of anything. You get better over time. Well, I mean, <clears throat> when you see something in the woods for the first time, you don't have anything to refer back to. It's mm-hmm. Hey, this buck is doing this. I've never seen that before. Well, I'll see something in the, in the woods and I'll think, well, this buck's doing this. Yeah, I remember one time another buck did that and here's how I killed him. Mm-hmm. And so I'll apply that to this buck. And if you don't have that experience, then you just don't have that opportunity. You don't have the second dot to connect mm-hmm. <laughs> to get where you need to go. Um, one of the last questions here that I had for this portion, you, I would, I'll give you credit to basically... <laughs> Annual trail camera data, I think, caught a lot of it more attention to the likes of you sharing it. And then uh, summer homecoming bucks is another thing that a lot of people kind of say interchangeably now. But I, I give you credit for at least being the pioneer that talked about it first publicly. Is there anything else that you have, uh, any theories that are just theories right now but aren't fact quite yet? Um, <laughs> I, got a, I got a couple things that I <laughs> Um, one day I'm when I retire, if I ever retire, <laughs> I, I got some things to share that I think uh, I, I've never seen anybody talk about, and I know they work. and And the reason I'm reluctant to share them is is I know that local hunters are, are gonna it's gonna give local hunters hunting the same areas I do a chance to undermine my efforts. And I don't want to. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag until I'm ready to hang my bow up for good. <laughs> so it's going to change the game. It's going to. I don't know if it's going to totally change the game, but it, it definitely works. And uh, yeah, I just don't want. I just now. don't want the local hunters to be able to use it at the same time because you know these these mature bucks. You can educate them in a hurry, mm-hmm. and you, you got to be real cautious about what you do, or, or you're going to educate them and not kill them. 
And if every Tom, Dick, and Harry in my area is running around doing the same thing I'm doing, well, guess what? He's educating all the bucks I'm trying to kill with the same method. Yeah. So uh, I got a couple things, but I probably better keep them to myself well, for a while. We'll be patiently <laughs> waiting. <laughs> yeah. We don't want you to retire, but we, now now I'm just curious to know. But um, no, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Really excited. We have a couple more podcasts that we're, we're going to record if, if time per, permits. The Whitetail Cribs, which is going to be a big one. It'll be live in November. And um, I'll let people... Uh, plug, plug whatever you'd like to plug. Uh, you can go to my website, higginsoutdoors.com. Um, Chasing Giants podcast is my weekly podcast. Um, Real World Wildlife Products is a uh, uh, food plot seed and deer nutrition company uh, that I'm co-owner of. So uh, you can check all those things out on the internet. Awesome. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everyone that submitted questions. And be sure to mark your calendar for the Whitetail Cribs episode that'll go live in November. I look forward to it.